Welcome to Diplomacy Classroom. I'm Lauren Fisher with the National Museum of American Diplomacy, and thank you for joining us for another segment of our program, today in which we will discuss how diplomacy addresses the global issue of refugees. The mission of our museum is to share stories of American diplomacy and the work of diplomats through our programs and exhibits. And our intention is to create a conversation with you about what is diplomacy and why it's important. So let's first talk about what is diplomacy. At the museum, we think of diplomacy as the art and practice of building relationships with countries and global partners. We also think about the skills and the tools diplomats use in maintaining those relationships. But at its core, diplomacy is about advancing interests. As US diplomats advance the interests of the United States, they work with counterparts from other countries and non-governmental organizations. They engage with countries around the world. But what are they working on? What issues forge these connections between diplomats? Well, there are many. So just to name a few, US diplomats work to promote business opportunities and trade. They advance US interests in science, health, technology, oceans, and they work with their military counterparts on arms control and security. They also work on humanitarian issues, which gets us to the subject of today's program. We're gonna take a closer look at a bureau within the State Department called Population, Refugees and Migration. We call it the PRM Bureau. The PRM Bureau focuses in on humanitarian issues and I've sort of pulled from their website to help us better understand their mission. Uh, the PRM Bureau promotes US interests by providing protection and resolving the plight of persecuted and forcibly displaced people around the world. I am delighted that today we have joining us two diplomats from the PRM Bureau, Stacy Gilbert, who is a senior civil military advisor, and Angelina Sen, who is a foreign service officer and a refugee coordinator to help us better understand what the challenges are facing refugees, how the State Department works on these issues and why it's important. And in, actually more importantly also for Stacy and for Angelina to help us understand how this, the refugee uh, challenge is an issue, how this connects to national interests and security. Um, but first, Angelina, Stacy, hi, thanks for being here. Um, I just want to remind our listening audience and our diplomacy fans that we are recording today's program. So if you're not able to stay for the whole event, um, or if you know someone who was not able to make it today, come back to our website. You can watch the entire broadcast. Um, so visit us at diplomacy.state.gov. You'll find that uh, recorded broadcast there. And also follow us on social media at NAMAD Museum. Uh, so you can stay in touch with us and, and learn about future programs and uh, future exhibits both online and within the museum. We have lots of people helping us make this program a success today. Jaquan, thanks for being here, and Elizabeth for producing. Elizabeth will be monitoring that comment box. So at the conclusion of our conversation today with Stacy and Angelina, Elizabeth will be feeding me your questions and your comments so I can share them with our guests. So please participate, let us know what you're thinking. Um, and with that, I think we're gonna kick things off. Uh, thanks again, Stacy and Angelina, for joining us. Stacy, I'm going to start with you. You are a senior civil military advisor. You've been working on refugee issues for 20 years. You're domestically posted, although you have worked a great deal out in the field working on refugee issues. And I'll just by that, I mean, in the field, I mean, you've worked in Burundi, Rwanda, Tanzania, Iraq, Afghanistan. And most recently, you were leading a team of folks to address the COVID-19 response for refugee po populations around the world. I, I can't even imagine sort of the challenges that COVID-19 brought to refugee communities around the world. And Angelina, 
you are a foreign service officer. So unlike Stacy, who's domestically posted, you work out of our US embassies around the world. And you have been, again, working on refugee issues for a long time. You're a refugee coordinator. And you have worked in Bangkok, Baghdad, Erbil, Beirut, and Kara. And you're coming to us from Bogota, Colombia, where you are working at our US embassy there. And so you also have deep experience in this issue. And I just wanna add that you um, received in 2019 an award for your outstanding achievement in global affairs for your work on the Syrian uh, refugee crisis. So I appreciate both of you being with us today to help us all better understand what and who refugees are and the challenges that they face. And so I know, Stacy, you've put together a slide deck for us to kind of help orient us to this topic. So I'm going to ask Elizabeth to go ahead and share her screen so we can have some visuals to help us guide us through the conversation. And then, Stacy, I'm actually going to turn it over to you um, to kick us off in the conversation. Stacey, Thank you, afraid. Lauren and others at the Diplomacy Museum. Um, it's great to have this opportunity to talk, talk about refugees, especially in the run-up to world. So just want to let you know you are a little World blippy. Refugee Day, which is on June 20th. Um, and I am very um, excited to be doing this and honored to be doing it with a good colleague of mine, Angelina Sen. And I think we can, um, okay, do a better idea of how and why that matters. So we're missing some of Stacy's audio, but hopefully she'll catch up. So one of the things I wanted to talk about is that refugees are, and refugee situations are different than what you might imagine. This is a case of a refugee camp in Syria. And usually when you think of a refugee camp, you may think of tents and fields, but, but this is clearly a city and an urban area with thousands and thousands thousands of people lining up for food in, and it's an early talk about in this presentation, we'll give you a broader idea of refugees and their situations and the assistance we provide to them. Next slide. So when you think of a refugee, you can think of maybe a, a village or a town and two families living next to each other. Maybe it's a place where there's been some, some political tension and one day there's gunfire in the distance and the two families decide we have to leave. This is enough, we can't take it anymore. One family goes one direction, maybe a hundred kilometers, and they cross an international border. They become a refugee if they were fleeing persecution. The other family, subject to the same anxiety and, and discrimination as the other family, goes 100 kilometers in the other direction, but they're in their own, they remain in their own country. That family are, they're not refugees. They didn't cross a border even though they may be subject to the same kind of fears, anxiety, and persecution that the other family faced. And that's, one, that's a key difference about refugees. They cross an international border fleeing persecution. That other family is still the responsibility of their own government. But for the country that crossed that international border, there is a UN agency responsible for their care and protection called the UN High Commissioner for Refugees. And the international community steps forward and says to the neighboring country, if you allow these people in to provide them protection and safety, 
we will help assist you and, and help you provide them assistance. It's more difficult in the country where the people have been persecuted by their own government, but they're still in their own country. There's a lot of negotiation involved in providing assistance to them. And we still try to do that. Um, but technically they are not refugees, although they still deserve protection, they still um, deserve assistance. So there are different groups that are responsible for refugees who cross international borders. Um, there are different factors involved in providing each group protection and assistance. But what is important to recognize is by crossing that border, those people become the responsibility of the international community. The people still inside their own country are still the responsibility of that government even if it was that government that caused the, the reason that made them flee. Next slide. So when you're a refugee, there's three ways to resolve that situation. Ideally, the situation changes in your home country and you're able to go back in safety and in dignity. If the situation doesn't change, hopefully the country that you fled to will allow you to stay in that country and provide you assistance and let you have some of the same basic rights and responsibilities of people in that country. That the children who are born get a birth certificate, children are able to go to school, some very, very basic things. To a small percentage of people in, around the world, if you can't go home and if you can't stay where you are, there is the possibility of being resettled in a third country, for example, the United States. And that's been in the news recently in terms of the number of refugees um, the United States will be accepting this year. After some low numbers in previous years, um, President Biden has said the United States will rebuild its refugee resettled country resettlement to a little more than 62,000 refugees in this fiscal year. Great. Hey, Stacy, a couple, slide. yeah, Stacy, a couple things. Um, we're having a little bit of a hard time with your audio. So I'm going to suggest that maybe you turn your camera off to see if that helps um, the audio. So it's maybe not so rough. Let's so give that a try. And just to, it was interesting where you were mentioning the resettlement um, so it, it seems that with each incoming administration, if it changes, uh, a presidential administration, that administration gets to set how many refugees we resettle here in the United States. So that number can change from administration to administration. Is that right? Yes. Yes, absolutely. Great. And here we are. We see a lot of numbers on this slide. Yeah, so without going into every number here, I did want to highlight a few things. One is that this number of refugees, the 26 million, that is roughly the population of Australia. So um, that it's significant. Um, I also want to highlight that that 40 percent of the world's displaced people are children. And what we say actually in refugee assistance is about 80% of refugees are women and children. And that's important to, to realize because sometimes when there's a conflict, the, the men of the family stay home to protect the home, possibly to, to defend their land, defend their people or what's, what remains of their community. And they usually send the rest of the family to seek asylum elsewhere. So it, it can be about 80% of refugee populations are, are women and children. And they tend to be pretty vulnerable. 85% um, are hosted in developing countries. The, it's not usually a case where there's a refugee outflow and then suddenly we see a lot of refugees in the United States. They're mostly hosted by the countries surrounding that country in conflict. And that's, it's important to those, those countries are not necessarily well-resourced. 
to provide assistance to their own people, much less thousands, or in some cases, millions of people who are fleeing conflict from a neighboring country. So these are, it's, when you look, when you really look at these numbers, it tells a story of, of people who are vulnerable, people who don't want to leave their homes and their home country, but they're forced to because there's, there's no other, there's no other option for them. So and countries that are host, countries that are hosting them are doing their best to provide assistance, but the international community steps in to also to help and, them provide that protection and assistance. Right, and I would think that with 80% of this population being women and children, the challenges as well as the solutions is gonna be unique to that, uh, to that community of women and children. I mean, it's gonna be very specific to, to that group. Can you hear me now? I can hear you now. Yep. Are we going to move to the okay. next slide? Yeah. Yeah. Next slide. Great. So to provide that assistance, we have um, PRM works. We can see a number of partners on the screen that you've listed here for us. UNHCR, which is the High Commissioner for Refugees. Except to know that these are large networks of technical specialists and professionals who have done this work for years, who are experts in water, sanitation, health, and they are there for the long term to provide assistance and protection to help those host countries for as long as is necessary until conditions change and people are able to return home. Next slide. These are also some great resources we have around the world. These are our refugee coordinators who are really our eyes and ears on the ground to see what the protection and assistance needs are, to see where we can help out both with the tangible items for assistance, as well as more importantly, really, the diplomatic resources that, that we can bring to bear to help resolve the conflicts that forced people to flee in the first place. And um, my, my colleague on this presentation today, Angelina Sen, has served in many of these locations. So she is, she is absolutely the best person to, to join us today to also talk about some of these challenges. All right, thank you. Thank you so much, Stacy, for sort of offering us that foundation in sort of refugees and who they are, the sheer numbers of them um, is just quite astounding. And, you know, Angelina, you've been there, you've been with refugees, you've worked with them, you've talked with them. You've also, I would imagine, worked with the networks, some of which uh, Stacy had on the slide, UNICEF, UN, you know, the High Commissioner for Refugees, um, working together to, to address the challenges that they face. So give us a little bit more insight um, from your experience on the ground. Thanks, Lauren. Uh, it's great to be here with you guys today. Please let me know if my feed is choppy and I can turn my camera off again too. Um, so yeah, so I have been with PRM over a decade now, most of that out in the field, um, and I started off working on the Thai-Burma border in 2010, working with the Burmese uh, refugee flow, the Lao Hmong, um, who were refugees dating back to the time of the Vietnam War, um, and then moved over to working with the Rohingya in Bangladesh, um, and then kind of graduated to Iraq, worked on uh, at the end of the Iraq war, um, joined that big civilian push to work on actually returns uh, of Iraqi refugees, um, which then shortly and very unfortunately morphed into working on the Syria crisis for almost seven years um, before I, I migrated back to the Western hemisphere. And now I'm working with the Venezuela crisis. 
Um, when you're asking about kind of what does that work look like? What does it look like on a day-to-day -day basis? I think that the easiest way to kind of walk you through what it looks like to, to be a diplomat working on humanitarian assistance on a day-to-day -day basis, it's, it's much easier to kind of illustrate it through by example. Um, and I'm not sure if Elizabeth, I had I had put some some photos actually just from my phone up into this deck so you could get a flavor of, of kind of what the day to day looks like, which is that no two days do look alike. <laughs> but um, but I think really interesting to understand um, what the reality is. I mean, for us, we're not just writing the checks. We are out on the ground in the country, um, talking to people, trying to figure out um, how to troubleshoot how to work with the host governments. Um, host country governments vary very greatly by you know, both capacity, uh, political willingness to engage, um, whether or not the relationship, the bilateral relationship with the US is strong. And so I think very individual and, and requires a very tailored set of skills to, to manage. Um, but I could talk about kind of what it looks like here in, in Colombia, I mean, Colombia, to give you a little bit of perspective, Colombia is hosting almost 2 million Venezuelan refugees out of around 5.6 million who are spread mostly over around 17 different countries in the region. Um, this has been the largest humanitarian crisis in the hemisphere and the largest movement of people uh, ever on in the history of the Western hemisphere. Um, and, and the vast majority, I think one of the things that's quite unique to what's happening here is that the vast majority of Venezuelans who've been forced to get up and leave Venezuela, it has been that they have come out by foot. They walk. Um, some of them are walking from Venezuela as far as Argentina at the very, very tip of South America. Um, you know, the average length of walk, even if people are, are planning to stay here in Colombia, they're walking between 800 and 1400 kilometers to get there on foot through the Andes mountains through, you know, they're having to walk up summit. Um, so, I mean, in that respect, I mean, to kind of give you an illustration of what we're doing, we call that the Ruta de Caminantes, the route of the walkers. Now, when you take into account who's walking and, and what shape they're in, that's where you can start to see the practical application of what we're doing on the ground. Um, you know, when we're looking at how people are moving, we're looking at, okay, what do, how are we meeting their life-saving emergency needs? People are coming out from a hot climate, they're moving into the mountains. Um, we're looking at, first of all, it's almost like Maslow's hierarchy of needs. We're looking at how do we give people life-saving assistance? What food do they need? Do they need blankets? Do they need warm clothing? Are the children walking in crocs? This is something that we see all the time. You see children who are dehydrated. You're seeing children who have exposure. You know, their feet are in terrible shape from trying to walk with their parents. So how do we address those needs? We're working with NGOs. We're working with international organizations like the UN Refugee Agency, the International Organization for Migration, um, and really working through them on the ground um, and playing this coordinating role with the host country government and kind of within this larger architecture that we call humanitarian architecture um, to try and identify and meet people's emergency needs in healthcare, emergency education, food, water, shelter. And that's really kind of the starting point of what we do. Um, once we're able to meet those emergency needs, which usually is quite a challenge, we're also very interested in trying to work with them on what's the next step. What happens when they get to a place where they, they have been stabilized? What happens when they're living in a long-term situation as a refugee outside their country, possibly with no rights? I mean, when you think about what it is to be a refugee, what it is to be outside of your home without status and how long that lasts, you know, it's probably a little bit surprising, but the average length of displacement nowadays is 17 years. So that's going on two generations of people who may not have the rights to be in the places where they're being born and, and where they grow up. Um, so I think for us, a big focus of what we've been working on is also that next step. It's how do we move from the life-saving to helping people to build back their resilience, to you know not just to be stable, but to be able to thrive and take back their agency. Um, as people and participate fully uh, in the in the societies that they're living. 
Wow. You know, I never really thought about it that way. You're, you are addressing their needs in their moving when they're, when they're leaving their home country and crossing that border. So they're in movement. And I can imagine the logistical challenges of that. But then there's also once they're stabilized, as you say, in the host country, and then there's another set of needs that happens there. So that's very interesting that there's um, sort of two, you know, many ways that they need help, but there's the movement. And then once they're stabilized, um, you guys, both of you have really outlined and really helped us understand sort of who refugees are and their challenges and why they may why they why need to leave their country. But let's connect it now to sort of the national security. I mean, this is the State Department. We conduct diplomacy. How is this conducted, conducted to our mission of advancing US interests and our security for our country? That's a great question, Lauren. And, and it's a really important one. I think that there's a few ways to answer this question. Um, the first one that we look at, especially you know, in the case of some very large conflicts is in terms of stability, regional stability, global stability, um, having come off of the Syria crisis where we were looking at, you know, who our allies are in the region and that our allies are most often the countries that are hosting the largest number of refugees. <laughs> you know, inside of Lebanon, when I worked inside of Lebanon, over a quarter of the people inside the country were Syrians. Uh, and you're already talking about a country that is under an incredible amount of stress, uh, economically, politically, you know, really on the knife's edge already. And then having an additional large population of people who have intense humanitarian needs to come in, you know, we're looking at helping to maintain the stability of our allies. Um, you look at other countries where we, we have Thailand. Thailand has been hosting Burmese for well over three decades. Thailand is a treaty ally of the United States. For us, it's a critical relationship uh, and it's one that we value very much inside of the context of Colombia. Colombia is our strongest regional ally in South America. For us, it is a fundamental foreign policy goal to help them with this very generous hosting of almost 2 million people. You know, Colombia has gone forward with temporary protection for 10 years for all of the Venezuelans inside of the country which is a tremendous offer, but you can only imagine what that means for them resource-wise in terms of granting full access to their education system, their healthcare system, and others. So for us, you know, this is a, this is a critical uh, foreign policy goal and a critical piece of helping regional stability stay in place. But there's a second reason as well, and, and that I think it's one that is very true to my heart in having found this work, and that is it's also about our values, our values as a country um, and what the U.S. is really about um, and making sure that we are not just at home complying with those values, but we're also representing those on an international level. You know, we are signatory to the Refugee Convention. We are, you know, a very strong proponent of humanitarian values and principles worldwide. So that's, uh, I think, the second cornerstone of why we do what we do. Um, because of the unique nature of who we are as the people of the United States. And as I listen to your words and look at these amazing images that you've so generously shared with us from your own iPhone as you've traveled in your work, I can see very much that it is this issues and these, these people are connected to your heart. Um, and so I kind of now want to shift a question before we move to our audience questions to both you and Stacy. You have dedicated your careers to working with refugees. Can you share with us a personal experience or a personal story that brings some of this to life for us today? And Angelina, you can start if you'd like, and then Stacy, um, you want to follow second? Yeah, and in fact, maybe Elizabeth, if we can go to the last photo, um, I I have a lot of I think very personal stories and stories of of folks who I have I have followed um, through my career, and this photo actually um, is one that was very dear to my heart. Um, I'm not sure how acquainted you guys are with when ISIS, you know, rolled over the hills of Nineveh, but there were you know, centuries old 
Chaldean Christian communities that live in the plains of Nineveh. And um, unfortunately, a lot of them, you know, when ISIS came through, there were massacres, there were, I mean, just horrific human rights abuses um, that were happening on the ground there. And, um, and during my time working up in Erbil, um, this was actually technically it's an IDP crisis because they hadn't crossed an international border. Um, but, you know, Iraqi Kurdistan was essentially receiving people as though they were refugees. Um, and there was, uh, you know, one place where we went to go visit a banquet hall that had been turned into a reception facility for some Iraqi Chaldean Christians. And they came across this grandmother. Um, her name was Habiba. And she asked, she said, can you please take my picture? And here with my two granddaughters and no one else from my family would, had survived, but I have a niece and a nephew who are American, who live in the United States. And I was like, well, you know, do you know where? <laughs> and she said, I'm not sure where they live. Um, and I said, you know what, we'll give it a shot. And we took her photo and uh, that visit happened to be on a Sunday morning. And, you know, with the time difference, I sent it back to one of my colleagues who was working on uh, the International Religious Freedom Portfolio. And she was very plugged into the, the Chaldean community in Michigan. And so she sent the photograph uh, to her entire network. And it just so happened it was a Sunday, right? So everyone was going to church and going to mass. And we were able to locate her niece and nephew the very same day and, uh, and send back somebody with a phone the next day. And by the next day, she had found her only surviving family in the U.S. Um, so I think, you know, it gives you an idea of when I talk about the humanitarian architecture, like that's what that really means, you know, the, that backbone that goes through in terms of people who care and, and take the time um, to try to really uh, make those connections and help people in the worst day of their lives. Right. And we think about diplomacy as connecting people too. And so thank you for being there for her and connecting her back to a lifeline, essentially, because I'm sure that just brought so much happiness to her in that moment. So that's such a sweet story. Stacy, do you have one you'd like to share? Yeah, in the spirit of um, displacement, I've moved myself to hopefully have a better, a, a better um, location. But as you can see, I, I also have um, my, um, yes. <laughs> Um, but I Your wanted to show there. a, um, yes. Um, I wanted to show something that has affected me when I was, when I was out doing monitoring. And this is, this is, um, hopefully you can see it. I was given this demonstration by a refugee woman in, um, she was from the DRC and I met her in Tanzania. She was, the refugee food ration had been cut, had been cut a little bit over a course of months. And she was angry and she wanted to show me what a refugee ration really was because I saw food in warehouses. I saw big, you know, big gunny sacks of flour. It looked like a lot of food to me, but she showed me what a person gets for one day as part of their refugee food ration. And I'm, I'm sharing it with you. So it is about a cup and a half of some kind of grain, in this case, wheat, um, about a third of a cup of beans or pulses, some kind of protein, um, uh, something called corn soy blend, which believe me, you don't, you don't want in anything. This is usually what they serve with water to make some kind of gruel for children, but probably a third of a cup. Um, a little bit of sugar. This is probably a tablespoonful of sugar and probably a half of a teaspoon of salt and a tiny little bit of oil, probably a tablespoonful of oil. All together, this is not this is not one meal. 
this is this is what you get for a day, this food for a day. And if you need to sell something to buy shoes for a child or to buy something else you need, you'll take a little bit of that and sell it on the market. And there's nothing wrong with that. Um, it's unfortunately, it's unfortunate that that happens, but if this is the only income that you're getting and you need to get something else, you're going to sell a little bit of it. And what don't you see in this, in this small amount of food? There are no fresh fruits or vegetables. There's no meat, no milk. If you want any of that, you have to buy it with your own money or you sell something that you have. So um, when it was one thing to see warehouses full of food, but when you see what it means, what a refugee has to live on each day, it's so very little. And it's the only word you can use to describe how people get by is, is resilience. This does keep them alive, but it's, if you had the idea that refugees get a lot, that they are living off the international community, just think about that assistance. It's not much. And as, Agil as Angelina said, you know, some people are in camps for 17 years, presumably there's children and there's growing children who are also subsisting on, on these rations. So it gives us a, a powerful window into the reality that they endure um, even if they're in a stable sort of host country, you know, what their reality is. We're going to switch to some questions because we have some questions popping in. So, so this is great. Thank you for sharing those stories. Um, thank you for what you do to help refugees, but this is, this is only a band-aid on the problem. What is happening to address governments who are responsible for persecuting their citizens? Either one of you, go ahead, Angelina. I'm happy to start off. I mean, you're absolutely right. Humanitarian assistance, we can put as much humanitarian assistance into a crisis as, as we could find dollars and it does not address the root causes of conflict um, and you know political persecution. That has to take place at the negotiating table, which is not just with the United States. You know, the US, we are firmly multilateral. We work through the United Nations. We work through joint mechanisms. We work through NATO, um, looking for long-term political negotiated solutions to these crises. Now, the question you can ask from that obviously is how effective is that? And it really varies by situation. Um, there have been places where ultimately there has been the ability for, for people to return voluntarily. And unfortunately, in other places, the crisis continues to deepen. Um, you know, we're just at the, the beginning of a new administration in the U.S. The Biden administration is reinvigorating their engagement on a number of different crises across the world. And I think we're going to see you know, new policies that start to unfold that are, you know, addressing those root causes of conflict, um, looking at how negotiated political solution might be able to, to move the, the, the needle. Um, but humanitarian assistance is, I mean, as you say, you could liken it to a Band-Aid. I mean, it's, a, it's very much an inadequate uh, you're not going to get a solution out of humanitarian assistance. But does that mean that we shouldn't do it? Absolutely not. I mean, we really need to be in there providing life-saving assistance. I mean, our mandate as an organization is, you know, to, to we are mandated to provide protection and emergency life-saving assistance to the best of our abilities. And that's what we do. Right. And so, you know, diplomacy is at work addressing this issues in the highest level of, of government. Um, Stacy, is there anything you would like to add to that? I will add that for our listening audience that 
Um, the museum, um, part of our mission is to work with students and to engage our audience in what diplomacy is. And we have a diplomacy simulation program that invites participants to play that role of a diplomat. And we have a sim simulation that it looks at a ref, it's a hypothetical refugee crisis. We developed it alongside of the PRM Bureau. So it mimics a real crisis, but um, it invites students to play that role of a government and um, there's there's governments and, and non-governmental partners at the table sort of negotiating a solution to a hypothetical crisis. So for our audience watching today, I'm going to ask um, Elizabeth if she wants to drop a link into the chat, um, connecting listeners to our website where you can find that program because if you're interested in exploring this issue and how diplomacy is at work, um, in the refugee issue, you can go ahead and explore those materials. Um, so I'm gonna keep moving because we definitely have some um, questions popping in here. Uh, what is the difference between those seeking asylum and those who are refugees? We get, we get this question a lot um, with our education programs. Stacy, do you wanna take that? Yeah, sure. Hopefully my, my connection will last. So an asylum seeker is someone who is broadly, who is, has a claim or says they have a claim to, to asylum, which means they are fleeing persecution and they are seeking protection in another country. So while that claim is being adjudicated until it's it's actually determined that that person is, is in fact, you know, from a community that is being persecuted, they, they would be considered an asylum seeker. Um, once, when that claim is adjudicated, they would be considered a refugee. That's more applicable on an individual basis. Clearly when there's a, um, uh, you know, an, an outburst of violence and there's a surge of, of, of you know, thousands of people coming across a border, it is generally considered that they are all refugees until, you know, individual claims and like an individual claim is made for each person. So, um, but in the United States, we, there are people trying to come to the United States or already in the United States and maybe something happens back home and they say, oh, I, I can't go back there or I will be persecuted. So what, when they are in the United States, they make a claim saying, you know, this is who I am. I can't go back or I will be tortured or killed. Um, so when they make that claim in the United States, they are considered an asylum seeker when they when they they're already in in our country when they when something changes back home and they say, I need protection. Understood. Great. And it's it's a little bit different between kind of how it's used um, just colloquially and and the legal version. Great. Hollywood. <laughs> yeah, right. Well, that's a lot of favors because I think some people have some misconceptions about what seeking asylum is. Um, and just to add on to what Stacy was saying, I mean, to seek asylum, you must be in a country of asylum. Um, so, you know, you're in your country of first asylum. So you wouldn't seek asylum from the U.S. unless you were in the U.S. Um, and then not every country has a national asylum system. So you might actually go to a country where there's, you're not able, able to avail yourself of even asking for asylum because they don't have a system to, to actually accommodate that. So, and, and again, I think the other thing to keep in mind that it's, I think the most important thing to take away from, from that question is, is that regardless of what system each individual country might have, there's conventional international humanitarian law, which is kind of supersedes all of it. So that, you know, when people are having to run from conflict, whether or not the, the country that's receiving them has an, a system, we would still look at what international law says about that. And that's what is generally regarded. So, you know, if you had to flee your country 
um, to, you know, stay alive, then you, once you cross that border, you are a refugee. Wow. Right. Thank you. I mean, yeah, you bring our attention to there is international law, but then each country has their own systems of government and their own, you know, uh, system of what it means to seek asylum or not in that country. Thank you. Another question. Does the State Department help to resettle refugees in the U.S.? as well as working with refugees abroad, which clearly uh, both of you do. But do we help to settle those refugees who are named to come to the United States? Do we help them resettle here? Yes, we absolutely do. Um, you know, the, I think the largest, the lion's share of our work is definitely international assistance. Um, so assisting folks overseas, but the, PRM and the State Department uh, oversees a critical piece of the U.S. Refugee Admissions Program. Um, and in fact, I've actually worked on the U.S. Refugee Assistance Program in a number of different countries uh, where we are working with the U.N. Refugee Agency to accept uh, refugee applications to, to join the U.S. program and be processed onwards. Ultimately, um, the adjudication piece is done by the Department of Homeland Security, but the State Department um, kind of runs the flow, the, the, the pipeline of the project. Um, and then Stacey, I, I don't know if you wanna comment uh, on the piece inside the US because PRM also plays a role in that. I'll tell you what, I'll move to the next question. And if she can get her audio back, we can maybe hear from her. Um, another question, in times of conflict, how do you promote stability within camps as a refugee coordinator? So I might not answer your question because I personally um, am a big supporter of a lot of the, the new um, policies around alternatives to camps. Um, you know, a camp-based situation is actually, I think, the worst situation. Um, obviously, in some locations, it's the only, the only one that's available. Um, but generally speaking, the, the PRM approach and the U.S. approach is to support the U.N. refugee agency's alternatives to camp. Um, being kind of put into a camp, it, it, it can oftentimes end up in, in basically the collective warehousing of an entire community. Um, where people are just kind of getting put somewhere and kept there for long periods of time. So we're always looking for alternatives to that. Now, what happens in times of instability? I mean, camp, being in a camp-based situation during a period of crisis or instability um, is oftentimes, I mean, I, they bear the brunt of it. Uh, I'll give you the example of, you know, when I was working in central Iraq and Baghdad in 2012, 2013, you know, it was really at the beginning of when ISIS was starting to come up, but we were seeing a lot of sectarian conflict um, in the western part of the country in a place called Al-Qaim. There was a refugee camp there that had Syrians in it, and in fact, they really took the brunt of, um, you know, the deprivation of when there was a lot of, um, there was, you know, basically internecine conflicts and warfare happening in that part of the country and they they locked the gates of the camp and they weren't bringing in any more you know we're talking about people who were going without food water you know basic medical care children were not being vaccinated there was no max there was basically no medicine available um so you can imagine um what it was like to be inside that camp during that period of time very hopeless um and i think you know worst case scenario that we we really look to find alternatives to That's very interesting to, you know, we've got constantly have to be thinking about refugee issues and the best way to deal with them. And so it's very interesting to think, yeah, shifting models um, and to best support those who need it. Um, you know, the museum, I just want to add the museum is, is very pleased and proud to be a part of the commemoration for World Refugee Day to talk about these issues and to highlight them. We do have on our website, and I'm gonna ask Elizabeth to drop a link um, into the chat. We just launched or just, uh, yeah, launched on our website, what we call a, a spotlight exhibit 
on the work of PRM. Actually, you see a QR code here that you can hold your phone up um, and get the link directly to that spotlight exhibit where we worked with PRM to sort of, again, articulate their work, um, a little bit of the history and the origin of that bureau. Um, and some of the artifacts that we have from those who have, who have worked on this issue and they've so generously donated to our collection. So I wanted to draw a, attention to that. Um, I, I have one, time for, I think we have time for one more question, but I do wanna say, Angelina, there is a comment in here of someone who really appreciated your story of the Chaldean family and that um, so often people do not have the same luck of being reunited with their family and getting to safety. So it was a, a, a beautiful story and I'm, I'm sure there are some stories that aren't so beautiful. So yes, this person has made that comment. Um, for you, our colleagues, I think someone has you in mind when they say, what kind of emotional and psychological support is there for those who are providing services to refugees, you, um, as well as the refugees themselves? Is there ways for you to kind of get the support you need? So, you know, I think we, we have already started to go down that, that line with looking at what what kind of a toll does it take on you doing this type of work after after some period? And you know, working on the donor side, you know, we're in a very privileged position in that we work in the field, but it's you know we're not providing the day to day services, so the stress on us individually is not as much as it is on the humanitarian aid workers. You know, and humanitarian aid workers are frontline. Oftentimes, they get they're actually getting caught up in the conflict at different times of their careers, and and you know they themselves are are going through a significant amount of trauma. And I think over the last, you know, I've been working with the bureau for over eleven years now. And when I first started, we we didn't really focus that much on on this question about staff care, psychological first aid, and that's been something that really has come up as a, as a very very um, important topic for us as a bureau and as a government over the last, I would say around five years or so, um, particularly in the context of the Syria crisis, what's happening with you know NGOs and UN workers who are inside Syria and how difficult that work is. Um, and then when the pandemic hit, thank goodness that we had done some work before because the amount of stress on people, you know, I, I could speak from the experience of being here in Colombia we went through a six months of like a very difficult time where we were almost fully locked down in our houses. Um, and the humanitarian aid workers were one of the exceptions and they were out in the field. And the commitment to continuity of service through a very difficult time and a time where, you know, also in the context of Colombia, which is also dealing with an internal conflict and, you know, a plethora of armed groups and, and all kinds of other types of, you know, dangers and stressors it's become something that we have put front and center. Um, you know, the, the, the saying of put your oxygen mask on first, we have to be really careful about that and make sure that, you know, our partners and their staff are being taken care of, um, you know, and, and that we're not burning through people and we're not, you know, creating more trauma. So, you know, that's another one of the, the big principles in humanitarian work is called do no harm. So I think, you know, now it's, it's something that we automatically look for inside of our programs. We want to know how are you going to look after your staff? How are you going to take care of them? What's the plan? Uh, you know, are you guys helping to do, you know, resilience building? I mean, that's a big term, but it, it means something very specific. You know, it's like, what are your leave policies? How are people supposed to look after their kids if they have to be isolated after they go out on a field mission? Um, you know, how often are you offering people counseling, um, downtime, all of those things are very, very important. Um, and I think, you know, in the time that I've been with the Bureau, I've seen a, a big evolution on, on our approach to this and how we prioritize it and we make sure that there's money and budgets for it. Thank you. Stacy. do you want to add to that? I, I just want to... I'm so sorry, we're having a hard time with Stacy's audio today. Her contributions have been so um, important. Um, Difficult it is when you're like. We're getting the gist that, gist that this work is difficult. And I think with that, I'm going to um, 
say thank you so much to Angelina and to Stacy on behalf of the museum. Thank you for your service to your country, for um, your hard work that you're doing with these refugee communities and for carrying forth the values as you so eloquently said, Angelina, of the State Department and, and, and working so diligently and beautifully on these humanitarian issues. So thank you so much for spending your time with us today. And for all of those uh, listening, this uh, program has been recorded. There's been so much that has been shared. Please revisit our website to learn, to continue to learn and explore about refugee issues and how the State Department engages in them. Thank you for joining us. Remember to follow us on our social media at Nomad Museum, and we look forward to seeing you at our next program. Thank you all so much. Bye. <laughs>